Oh, guys, this video is going to be a bit different. Um, I recently experienced something that I never thought I would. Um, and it was mainly due to me having a lot to think about, a lot to, you know, a lot going on at one time, not thinking about my meds like I should have. And so um, I missed a dose of I missed two doses almost of uh, my long acting strongest painkiller. Um, and for those of you who know what this means, I won't even need to go any further uh, because you'll understand <laughs> exactly what I went through. Um, it's called, or they call it, they, doctors, people in the street, whatever, people, society call it heroin without the high. And it is very true. It it has no high to speak of, but uh, the withdrawal is like nothing I've ever experienced. And it's no secret that I have a past. Um, it was never pills. Um, it was mostly alcohol that um, I had the problem with for, I don't know, it was like two or three years or something like that. But, excuse me, I can't quit belching. But, I mean, I've been through withdrawal. I've been through DTs. I've been through, you know, I went through detox and rehab myself. And when I realized it was becoming a problem, I did that because, you know, it was really wrecking havoc on my family and my marriage. So, you know, I, I did all of that stuff and I experienced it to the max. Um, physically, emotionally, mentally, you know, all of that with alcohol, but just in those few years. And uh, the doctors, by the way, say that I was born with this autoimmune liver disorder, and um, it was either that or I had some kind of infection that lasted a long time that I either didn't know about or I didn't get to in time or whatever that caused it. So um, the drinking itself contributed to the liver failure. And the extent of the injury to the liver, the cirrhosis, and the speed at which it affected me. But it did not cause the actual autoimmune hepatitis, like so many have accused me of, whatever. Um, so anyway, uh, I do have a past, and I do understand withdrawal. I do understand drug addiction to an extent. Um, and when I was first diagnosed uh, with the autoimmune disorder and I was on tramadol, which is the lowest of the lows, um, I did kind of go through a little bit of withdrawal from that too when pain management in West Virginia wasn't handled correctly and I was just left to my own devices. So um, I know what withdrawal is, but that tramadol to go from, going from tramadol to this was like going from kindergarten to getting my PhD. <laughs> I mean, oh my God, it was so terrible. I woke up and this was last night. Was it last night? It was last night, this morning at one o'clock in the morning. I woke up in extreme pain and it was coming from the middle of my back and it just, it radiated throughout my entire body up into my head and my arms my fingers down into my legs and my toes and I mean everywhere it was just my whole skeleton was in my skull was just aching so badly that it I couldn't think long enough or hard enough to know what the hell was going on with me I thought I was dying and I know you're going to get tired of hearing me say that. I thought I was dying. But a lot of this physical pain will make you feel like that. Um, the fatigue will make you feel like that um, by itself, let alone together. My God. Um, from any one medication, New Lasta, the white blood cell uh, factor, growth factor is, is infamous for it. But anyway, um, so 
I didn't realize what was happening. It, it all happened within the span of like a half hour, maybe 45 minutes. But in me explaining it, it's going to go slow motion, but it all happened so quickly that I didn't have really a chance to think about it before I did it. And when I started to sweat, I knew that it was some kind of withdrawal because that was that's classic sign for me when I'm in withdrawal from something. And it doesn't have to be painkiller. I mean, I've been in withdrawal from prednisone. Um, so, and that's another, you know, it attacks your adrenal glands and it will hijack them. So you come off of that stuff too fast and you're going to know it. <clears throat> uh, sweating and being hot and cold at the same time, that's, that's huge. I mean, I knew exactly what it was as soon as that hit. So I had to go down through my meds and my mind and um, in the little plastic boxes, you know, that you carry around with you when you're chronically ill that you absolutely must to keep track of all of this stuff that you got to take during the day. Um, otherwise, you'll be screwed and miss all kinds of stuff. Um, so I'm going down through this box and I'm like, oh my God, it's my painkiller. Like, seriously, I missed that. And then I'm going down through my mind, like, did I take one of those today or this afternoon? I'm like, no, I don't think I did. And then I just missed it by an hour again. And no wonder I'm in withdrawal. So I hurry up and I take one of those things. And, you know, I have two of them, long acting, strong, very strong, no high. Um, and in the rescue that it, they give me in the hospital uh, that I'm technically allergic to, but generally don't have a problem with as long as I take Benadryl, um, you know, when I start to itch or whatever. It's no big deal. It's not like a breathing thing. It's just, it's mostly rash, not even hives. It's just a rash. So anyway, um, that there's a high that's associated with that in the hospital, but when you're on the pills, it's not so bad. I mean, mixing it with that other thing is, though, that's why I can't drive. But anyway, um, so all of this stuff happened so quickly, but I mean, it was like I was sweating and I was hot and cold at the same time. I tried to apply ice and pressure to my back, thinking that it would help take some of the, the pain away or whatever. It didn't. The ice just made me feel even worse. I tried to apply heat, the heating pad. It didn't work. Um, I was like, I'm either going to go in the shower and, you know, get completely in there and um, do like a lukewarm kind of thing and just sit down or whatever. And um, how I was going to sit down by myself, I don't know, because I still have a spacer in my leg and I'm not supposed to be walking on it at all. The spleen thing kind of shot that to hell. Hopefully I don't break my leg for any reason. Um, so it was either the bath, the shower, or go and wake my mom up to just massage my back until it, it stopped hurting, which I didn't want to wake her up because the dog had already woken her up several times and she has to get up and take me to chemo and then go to work and commute and got awful traffic and, you know, this and that and the other. And, you know, I, I just didn't want to be inconsiderate to her and for my own stupidity. And then, you know, going into the shower, it was just a lot of work because it was like just walking from my bed to the shower and my bathroom is connected to my bedroom, but still that walk hurt like hell. And every movement I make just hurt like hell. So I just curled up into the fetal position in my bed. I kept drinking sips of water and praying that it kicked in and praying that God would just take the pain away because I couldn't stand it. And once my bones started to feel a little better, then my muscles started to draw up. And I was like, when that happened, I was like, now I know why they call this what they do. Because I've seen videos of people coming off of heroin, and that's one of the first things that happens is their muscles draw up, and they're dehydrated. You know, they're not eating or drinking what they're supposed to. They're on drugs, and that's what replaces their meals and stuff. So, I mean, not that it's funny, but, I mean, duh, of course that would happen. And I'm just like, wow, like, am I, am I really not taking that you know, care myself like I should. I mean, I'm, I'm not, 
a junkie here. I mean, I'm just trying to follow orders, you know, and with my doctors and all this stuff is going through my head and it was awful. And it gave me a different perspective on withdrawal and heroin addicts, especially. And this is not really such a big deal here. I mean, you probably see it everywhere, especially big cities like this. I mean, I'm sure drugs is a, a major cause of homelessness and poverty and, you know, anywhere you go, but especially in a big city like Pittsburgh. Um, but I don't see it. Uh, where I live, is it's not my face like it was in West Virginia. West Virginia, it's everywhere. And a lot of times, and this is one of the things that I wanted to really emphasize in the book that I was writing before I moved, um, we, we point the finger at the addict and we think that they can fix themselves. And it's not even they who are broken, it's a system. Because I know in all of that, Today, when I went to chemo, even though my chemo doctor and the nurses who I see every day for a week, a month, um, the lab workers that I saw today, they all were very concerned about that withdrawal last night. And they encouraged me to get a hold of palliative care and work out some kind of plan or, you know, they were offering suggestions of putting an alarm on my phone to keep up with my med schedule and, you know, all of this stuff. In West Virginia, they wouldn't have done that. And in fact, they often leave, you know, doctors leave you to your own devices, you know, and I don't know how palliative care pain management works in West Virginia. I've never been on it, but my guess, you know, because of what I've read, because of what I've seen, because of what other people in pain management have told me, it's not like that. They don't take care of you like that. So it's, I knew I had backup, even though I was going through all that stuff um, and calculating what would take longer, taking a pill or going to the ER. You know, in my case, I was taking the pill because I live so far away from the ER that I was admitted to and where the palliative care is. But I wouldn't have had that in West Virginia. And the relief that I have living here is that I am taken care of to the max. I get, I don't get along with some of my doctors, but I have to say that they are all very diligent or diligent, diligent. I don't know. Um, something like that in my care. Um, I guess diligent and constant vigilant, vigilant, vigilant. Yeah. Anyway, so. They're very um, into my care. They're very into taking care of me and making sure that I'm okay. And by contrast, by comparison, West Virginia just doesn't do it. And and that was pretty much the theme of my book of, you know, we were pointing a finger at the wrong person, at the wrong group of people. And, and I had that sympathy before, but experiencing that withdrawal gave it to me even more. Like, these people are not the enemy. Junkies, addicts, whatever, heroin, whatever you want to call them, it, it's all the same, but it, it's not their fault. A lot of it is not their fault. And often it, it starts with being prescribed these strong medications and then being cut off so that they are forced to go to the street. Here, it's not that way. There. It's like every case that I've ever talked to, and it's a lot. So I wanted to make this video and let you know that I went through it. I came out of it alive, thank God. It only was like a few minutes, it wasn't even an hour, but that was enough for me to, to realize how strong these medications are, to respect them, and to um, basically you know, revolve my life around that schedule right now because I need to for my physical health. Um, the pain was, I can't describe it other than what I said. It was, it, it wasn't the worst pain I've ever felt in my life only because the intensity was not as severe as some other things. Like, I think the worst pain was 
the biopsy for my knee when they found the osteomyelitis and they they perforated that perforated they punctured that pocket of pus and it all came out and the pressure and all that was all released and it was just wow it was bad the intensity in that one spot i wanted to cut my leg off and i was yelling at them on the table i actually came off the table physically jumped off the table but that was pretty bad um but the intensity of that it can't be compared to what I had what happened last night because it was widespread it was unavoidable it was like inescapable like you know they eventually stopped the pain in my leg when they closed me up and you know shot me full of pain meds but last night it was like I was on my own at least for that hour and it was <laughs> it was very scary um and to know that people go through that for days at a time, it's unbelievable to me. No wonder, no wonder they stay high. No wonder they stay in that prison, in that cycle. Because it is a prison, because it's no life. I mean, think about that. You don't function, you're not in control, you're dozing off. I've dozed off, nodded off, whatever, with the two combination, you know, when I take them together. Now I'm getting used to them a bit, but... At first, it was, especially in the hospital, I would be sitting up and, and nodding off. And you were still awake, but you weren't. You were just kind of there. And that's no life. But the, the flip side of that is to go through that pain. And it's scary. The thought of it is scary. For me, it's scary. Uh, that's a lot of trust that I have in these people. Um, but I do have the trust because it, they've proven to me that they can take care of me. If I was still in West Virginia, I wouldn't have that trust and I wouldn't be in this position. Um, I don't know where I'd be, but it wouldn't be with pain management there. I guess that's why I didn't get on pain management until I was here. I don't know, but. So anyway, that was the video. That was the withdrawal video. Uh, there's a lot more thoughts I have on that that will probably have to be done in writing only because I can self-edit and <laughs> put all that stuff on my blog and uh, it could get a, a lot longer than just sitting here and talking about it. In fact, it probably will. Um, this is exactly where this is going to go. It's probably on my blog once it's done. I have a lot of thoughts on on addiction heroin addiction especially because it hit my area my hometown so hard and we just continue as a society as a country to point fingers at the wrong people and it's really disheartening and it's really it's heartbreaking because those people are under enough that they don't need our judgment to and yes we all have a responsibility to take care of ourselves but when you're down that low you really can't you can't you need help and your brain actually works against you but i'll get into that later into my writing my research and stuff so i will see you guys on the flip side god bless you all later